Lord Jesus, we are just grateful for you. And we want to we wanna know you more. We want to know your heart. Lord, would you change us today? Would you transform us to be more like you, more like you in your goodness and your love and your holiness and your depth, your wonder? We give you this day. We give you ourselves, Jesus. Amen. All right, so this summer, we have been in this series called All In. Okay, and we've been doing this the last few weeks, looking verse by verse at Jesus's Sermon on the Mount in the Gospel of Matthew to see what this kingdom of God looks like and what life in it is supposed to be like. How are we supposed to live? And my hope is that so far and throughout the rest of the summer that we would use this as a framework for our lifestyle, that this right here would be like, oh, this is how the kingdom of God works. And therefore, this is how Mercy Road Church Northwest will live. We, as a community of believers, will follow this through and through with every part of ourselves, seven days a week. This would become our lifestyle, not just a Sunday morning obligation, but a lifestyle. Right, That first week, we talked about Jesus' invitation to follow him, and we talked about what that really means to make him the center of our lives and devote everything to becoming just like him. And then we got into the sermon itself, talking about uh, this new worldview, how God places value and favor on the poor, the meek, the broken, the sinners, the suffering, the, the positions that we consider to be unvaluable and undesirable, unlovable. And then JD brought us through what it means to be all in in each of our contexts through even through persecution when that comes our way using Jesus analogy of salt and light. And then last week, Pastor Harrison talked about understanding scripture and understanding Jesus as the fulfillment of it and not the abolishment, right? This idea that Jesus's way of living, the kingdom way of living is what God has been trying to convey all along. From the beginning, God has been trying to communicate a new way of living. And Jesus says, hey, I'm here to show you how to do it. I'm here to explain it for you. I'm here to display it for you. And so today, this all brings us to this moment where we get into one of the tougher parts of the sermon. If you have any familiarity with Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, you might know what I'm referring to. Today, we are talking about murder, adultery, divorce, oaths, revenge, loving your enemies, all of the good things. Can I get a woohoo? Yeah. We are stoked about this, right? This is the best topic. This is the best one. This, woo, this is great. I'm so excited. Uh, but no, seriously. Seriously, it will be great. It will be very good. And it's not what you think it's going to be. This is not shame day. This is not the day where we're like, hey, here are all the sins that are going to ruin your life. Um, no, that's not what we're doing. Um, obviously, we have a lot to cover. So let's just get right into it, okay? Um, uh, one disclaimer, like obviously these texts, uh, th these words and these ideas are like, oh, that's a lot. That's really intense, man. Um, but we have to adjust our minds around that. Some of the ideas today are going to be a little bit uncomfortable. They're going to be countercultural to what we often hear around us. But this is Jesus. This is Jesus speaking. And so as followers of Jesus, we need to be willing to open up our minds, our hearts, and our hands and say, you know what? Jesus' way is better. And so whatever presuppositions I walk into about these topics, I need to lay them out of the, at the feet of whatever Jesus says. Okay, so can we do that? Can we, can we step into it in this way? In the words of Paul in Romans, he says, our role as followers of Jesus is not to conform to the patterns of this world, but to be transformed by the renewing of our minds. The renewing of our minds. We will have new mindsets, new worldviews that are like Jesus's. Okay, that said, let's open up our Bibles this morning to Matthew chapter five, verse 21. If you don't have your Bibles, it's gonna be on the screens here. And if you don't own a Bible, then we have one for you in the lobby and I definitely encourage you to get one. All right, verse 21. We're finishing up chapter five today too. So let's do this thing. You have heard that it was said to the people long ago, you shall not murder and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you, that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to, to judgment. Again, anyone who says to a brother or sister, Raka, is answerable to the court. And anyone who says, you fool, will be in danger of the fire of hell. 
Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your, that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled to them, then come and offer your gift. Settle matters quickly with your adversary who is taking you to court. Do it while you are still together on the way, or your adversary may hand you over to the judge, and the judge may hand you over to the officer, and you may be thrown into prison." Truly, I tell you, you will not get out until you have paid the last penny. All right, let's pause there really quick. That was a lot. That was a lot happening. Uh, Let's remember what Pastor Harrison said last week in the text immediately before this. All right, Jesus is like, hey, I'm not abolishing the law. I'm not getting rid of it. What I'm teaching is the wholeness of the law and how to walk it. And so Jesus in this passage is basically clearing up laws that they are already familiar with, some misunderstandings that they have. And so we'll see repeatedly throughout our text, we'll see him say, you have heard it said, and then he'll say, but I say to you. Okay, and it's easy to read that as like, oh, so Jesus is just putting the X on that old commandment. Do away with it, this one. That one is no good. No, 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 that's not what he's doing. He's saying, you've heard it was said and you misunderstood it. I say to you, this is what it was for. Does that make sense? Are are we following here? Like, Like it wasn't a getting rid of, it is a clarification. So he takes murder, okay? A known law, one of the 10 commandments, and this is a big one in our culture today too. Like this isn't an old thing. It's like, ah, back in the day when murder was bad, you know what I mean? Like, no, we're, we're, murder's still bad, all right? All right, some people might say that morality is subjective, but on everyone's list, Murder's still a no-no. Like, that's just kind of, everyone's on the same page about that. We're like, no, we don't kill people. I don't have to go to my two-year-old and be like, hey, don't kill anyone today. Like, she just knows. Like, that's just like a, in her brain, she knows not to do that, right? Um, and so, so to some extent, we don't have to teach that. That's something that's in us. We know murder's not good, right? So these disciples, in the same way, they're like, okay, yeah, I'm tracking with you, Jesus. He's like, you've heard it said, don't kill people. And then he's like, yeah, 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 yeah. We're totally following you. And then he says, but I say to you, and they're like, oh, uh-oh. Surely Jesus isn't about to tell us that we can kill whoever we want. <laughs> like, surely he is not about to change this law on us. And he says, instead though, he says, I say to you, anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Anyone who says raka, which was a a word of contempt in that time, it meant empty-headed, empty-headed, a word of contempt, raka. Even they are answerable to the court. Anyone who says you fool will be danger of the fire of hell. They're like, whoa, 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 whoa. That's that's intense, Jesus. (laughs) That's really intense. Let's clarify something really quick too, okay? Some of you may be like, oh no, I called someone a fool yesterday does that mean I'm done? Like, is that it? Is it over? Am I in danger? Like, I'm, I'm going to the fires, right? Like, that's it. Game over. Let me clarify. Let's ease some minds this morning. That is not, that's not what was meant, okay? He's not saying, like, black and white. If you say the English words, you fool to someone, done. No forgiveness there. You're out. You're out. It's over. Um, I've actually called someone a fool before. This is a funny story. It's so weird. So I called someone a fool and I didn't do it like in an angry way because in our day, who does that? Like when you're in an actual angry mood at somebody, you're not like, ah, you fool. Like, like people don't do that. Like you fool is more of like a joking term. It's like, ah, you're a fool. Like, uh, like that kind of thing. And so I called somebody a fool and someone came up to me and they were like, don't ever say that. They're like, you take that back. Jesus is going to put you in hell. And then they showed me this verse and I was like, whoa, that's super intense. And also not at all what he was saying. Um, I was like, that's not, that was not what he was like getting at here. Like you're, you're, you're confused here in the situation. Okay. And so let's clarify. He's not referring to that. He's not saying that if you say those words and you're out, you're done. No, what he's getting at is a larger point in this whole paragraph. He's saying, hey, killing people isn't the heart of the issue in murder. That's not the heart of the issue. The heart of the issue in the command against murder is anger and hate and disdain towards other people, other image bearers, brothers and sisters. Even lashing out in anger is not okay. Lashing out in any type of anger, it doesn't have to be murder. It's not about the murder. It's not about the killing. It's about the anger. It's about what's in here that's the problem. 
I'll also add, Jesus isn't talking about in this moment, in this passage, he's not talking about eternal torture when he says this. He's not talking about that when he says, when he says those words. And this goes for the rest of our text today. When we read hell here, that is our English translation of the word Gehenna. Everybody say Gehenna. Gehenna. And Gehenna was the trash heap that was outside of Jerusalem. They would burn all their trash and everything outside of Jerusalem. And so it was, they would get all the filth, the dead animals, everything, and they'd burn it outside the city walls. And so Jesus is playing on that here as he's talking about what it means to be a citizen of the kingdom. And he says, we don't do that. That kind of stuff is reserved for the trash heap outside the city walls. This is how you act in the kingdom. And this is, no, that goes to the trash heap. That gets burned. That's for the non-kingdom citizens, right? And so in kingdom, murder, not okay. That's a given. But don't even get angry with other people. Don't have outbursts or contempt toward others at all because that is the heart of the issue, right? That's the heart of the issue. Let's continue with what Jesus says. He says in verse 27, you have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell, into the trash pit. And if your right hand causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. Okay, once again, (laughs) pretty intense. All right, that's like, at first it was the, hey, don't kill people, but don't even get mad at them. Now it's like, you even look at somebody wrong? game over, you know, or it's like the, it's like the, oh, you, you, your eye caused you to stumble. Get that thing out of there. Get, grab a spoon, take their eye out, you know, like cut off your hand. Like that's what it takes, you know? And you're like, Jesus, that's chill, man. Like that's really intense. We're talking about taking your eyes out. That's, that's crazy. He says, you've heard it said, don't commit adultery. That'd be defined as, as sex with someone other than your husband or your wife. And he says, but if you even look at someone with the desire for an illicit relationship, you've already committed adultery in your heart. And this wasn't a completely new idea, okay? Jewish teachers held this belief, some of them did at the time, but they weren't as extreme as Jesus was with what he said next. Like the, if the right eye causes you to stumble, take the thing out. If your right hand causes you to stumble, cut it off, get rid of it. And once again, I don't think Jesus is literally advocating <laughs> for taking your eyes out or cutting off your limbs. What Jesus is getting at here is that it would be better for you to endure something that obnoxious and that terrible than to put your whole body, your whole self in the trash heap. If something is going to lead you out of this kingdom, get rid of it. He says, it is better to be without whatever it is that's keeping you from this kingdom. It's better to be without that than to be without kingdom. That has to go. There's something that's holding you back, gotta go, get rid of it. And he's trying to communicate. He's giving some some pretty intense words here. He's saying like, oh, even if it's your hand, if it's something as important as your hand or your eye. So it's, it's not, he's trying to convey the exaggerative nature of this. He's like, man, anything, anything, nothing is worth losing the kingdom. Nothing is worth being tossed into the trash heap outside of the city walls. And again, just like murder, Jesus doesn't seem to be bent on the action itself, but what lies beneath it. It's not just murder, it's anger and hatred toward another person. It's not just adultery, but lust and desire for what you don't have. It's viewing others in that way and therefore devaluing them to nothing more than a means to relieving a sexual appetite. That's the problem. The problem is not the actual act of adultery itself. The problem is what's happening in here. Every time. And so it may be easy to hear or read these and be like, man, Jesus, that's really intense. That's harsh. Like, what's the harm in being mad? What's the harm in, you know, some dirty thoughts every once in a while? Like, it's not hurting anybody, right? So what's the big deal? But Jesus wants to be abundantly clear here. That's not how we do things in this kingdom. Because that infects you. That is not how we do things in this kingdom. We don't view people like that. We don't treat people like that. 
And if we look at this in the context of last week's text, once again, the kingdom has never been about that. I mean, I, I think it's, it's like God said, you know, he's, he's there giving the commandments on Mount Sinai. And he says, don't murder. And in his mind, it's because people have value. And so we should be striving for peace with one another, right? It's like in his mind, that, that makes sense. But we hear that commandment, we're like, okay, sweet, don't murder. That's the line. <clears throat> Does that mean I can go all the way up to the line? Like, it's like, this is where I can, this is what I can do. I can still have hate for someone. Can I maim them? Like, can I, can I still do that much? Like, I, I didn't kill them, so it's fine, right? I didn't break any of the rules. I didn't break the commandment that God gave me. It's, it's as if we always want to know where the line is exactly so that we can do everything up to it. What can I do with my boyfriend or girlfriend before it's considered adultery? What drugs can I do before it's actually bad? I wasn't actually doing anything with anybody. I was just watching porn, so that's fine, right? No, 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 it wasn't even that point. I didn't even watch porn. I was just thinking about it, so that's okay, right? Jesus is saying, you're not understanding the point. You're asking the wrong question. You're looking at this commandment and you're saying, okay, so how much can I live outside the kingdom before I cross the line? How much can I do these things? It's, it's okay, this is a weird parallel because of the topic at hand, okay? But it's like my toddler, okay? So <clears throat> we're obviously at the point, she just turned two on Friday. And so we're at the point where we're teaching her what she can and can't do. And she really wants to do the things that she can't do. Um, and she's very passionate about it. Um, and so we're learning obedience in that sense, okay? And we learned this recently, uh, a week and a half ago with crayons. Uh, crayons are for paper, nothing else. Um, yeah, that's a great lesson that I didn't want to have to teach. Um, but we walked into the living room and found blue crayon on the couch, on the table, on the floor, on the windowsill, on the windows, um, everything in sight. And so we were like, Judea, you have to color on paper. You can only color on paper. She says, color on paper. And I was like, yes, good, good job. You're understand. you're with me here. Like you, you are color on paper. And then she walks over, looks at the pillow. She goes, I color this. No, no, we only color paper, only paper, okay. She walks over here, she looks at the floor, she goes, I color this? No, no, Judea, you don't color that, you color paper. Okay, okay, she's like looking for everything. It's like she's like trying to come up with things. She takes out her like cups out of her drawer, she's like, I color this? No, you don't color that. And at this point, I'm just like, all right, you don't understand. You can only color paper. Like nothing else in the house is to be colored. We're not coloring anything else with our blue crayons. And that's what we're doing with God. That's what we're doing. He's like, hey, I've given you a piece of paper to color on. And we're like, can I color on something else? And he's like, color the paper. This is the best way to do it. You're gonna actually have this beautiful artwork. You're gonna love coloring on the paper. And you're like, ah, but I really wanna color on the pillow. <laughs> and you're like, if I color on the pillow, can I still get into heaven? If I color on the floor, can I still get into heaven? I know it's not what you wanted, but will it still get me in? Do we, do we see how that question, like when we put it that way, it sounds kind of terrible. <laughs> We're over here saying, how can I live? Can I still live outside the kingdom, but then get in? Because I really want to live outside. But I want the benefits of the inside. And so we're saying, can I color here? Can I color here? Can I color here? He's like, what a terrible question to ask. Like, are you really asking me how, like, how many people are you allowed to hate? Like, like I really want to hate people, you know? Like, oh. <laughs> how many people can I hate before it's bad? You know, like, or like how, how, can I, how can I have the, you know, I want to re release this, you know, sexual appetite. And so what can I do before it's a sin? Like, that's what we're asking ourselves. We're asking these kinds of questions. And he's like, those, those are terrible questions. As a follower of Jesus, we should never be asking, what anti-kingdom things can I do before it kicks me out of the kingdom? We need to stop asking what we can get away with and instead ask, how can I love Jesus better? Instead, I can say, look at the paper I get to color on. <laughs> look at that. Look at what I can do with this. There have been great people throughout our history that have done great things by coloring on the paper. And they didn't have to go color on the walls or color on the couch. A lot can be done with the paper. 
we just don't want to do any, we just don't want to do it. We'd rather have what we want. And so the question we have to ask ourselves, are we so unwilling to live life in the kingdom? We need to face ourselves with that very real and intense question. Are we so unwilling to live life in the kingdom? So unwilling to let go of a life that's outside of the kingdom. We're holding on to it tightly. Say, I don't want to get rid of it. I don't want to get rid of the hate. So how much of this can I hold on to before it kicks me out? I don't want to stop hating people. I don't want to stop doing this sin or this thing or this thing. I don't want to stop doing that. So how much of it can I hold on to before I don't get to have the benefits anymore? Because I'll hold on to all that I can until I meet the line. Until I get to the line that I'm not allowed to cross it anymore. Let's keep going. Jesus isn't done here. He's got a lot more to say. Uh, This is in verse 31. It has been said, Anyone who divorces his wife must give her a certificate of divorce. But I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife, except for sexual immorality, makes her the victim of adultery. And anyone who marries a divorced woman commits adultery. All right, once again, this rubs a lot of people the wrong way because this text has been used time and time again to shame people. And divorce is very common in our culture. It's very common. Most all of us have been exposed to it in one way or another, whether it was us or a family member, a parent, friends, whatever it is, it is common. Uh, Today, 41% of first marriages end in divorce. And the fact that it has to clarify first marriages says a lot. Like that speaks volume right there. The fact that in the statistics, it's not just, oh, this amount of marriages, it's this amount of first marriages, assuming there will be a second and a third and a fourth, right? 60% of second marriages end in divorce. And 73% of third marriages end in divorce. So let me just say, a lot of people have used this text for, for not great things towards people, but if you have been divorced, Jesus still loves you. Jesus still values you. And you can still accept Jesus' invitation to be part of the kingdom. That does not disqualify you. The apostle Paul killed people before he became a follower of Jesus. It does not disqualify you. There is forgiveness in this kingdom. Okay, and so I wanna clarify that from the get-go. There is forgiveness and mercy and love in this kingdom for the things that are in your past. Okay, there is no shame. Unfortunately, This text has been used in all those ways, but Jesus intended to do just the opposite with these words. And there's a lot to unpack that we don't have time for, maybe another time. Uh, But for now, let's look at the core of what he's getting at. Who is doing the action here and who is receiving? If we look at the text, it says, anyone who divorces his wife. So the man is doing the action. The, The woman is receiving, is the victim of this action. And in this culture, this this patriarchal society, many men viewed their wives as no different from their property. That was just the way that it was. That's how they viewed women. And this was particularly seen when a woman was divorced. When a woman was divorced, she was left out onto the street with nothing, right? Because now she has no She has no power, no rights, no nothing. That's all in the man. And so you only have that. If you are a woman, you only have that if you're married, if you are are taken in into a family. And so if you are left out, you've got nothing pushed out to the margins of society. She would become the type of person that Jesus was addressing in the Beatitudes, the person that nobody cared for, but he did. And so once again, Jesus seems to be telling us that these laws are not necessarily about the specific outward actions like murder, like the explicit act of adultery, not the divorce itself, but our inner heart. How do we view people? And in this case, talking to his male disciples, men, how do we view women? We see this come up again in Matthew 19. Jesus is posed with a a question. uh, And I think this helps clarify it a little bit too. It says, hey, can, you know, they, they go up to him. They say, hey, can we divorce our wives for any and every reason? They actually ask that question. And he's like... No, <laughs> like, like, no, no, of course not. Once again, like we were talking about before, that's the wrong question. 
What kind of question is that? Like, are you just waiting for a way to get out? Are you looking for the loophole? Are you saying, okay, at what point can I get out of this? What's the reasoning? At what point is divorce allowed? Because I want to get divorced. I want to live in this whole thing. I want to live in this thing outside of the kingdom. So how much can I do this? And it's acceptable. Under what circumstances can I do a worldly thing and not get punishment for it? But Jesus is like, that was never the intent of marriage. Again, you have missed the point. Marriage is meant to be unbroken, unseparated, a covenant bound by God. So what kind of question is it to be like, hey, what's my way out? (laughs) What can I do so I can get out of this? What would make divorce okay? You're asking the wrong question. You have the wrong view of marriage. You have the wrong view of your wife. You have the wrong view of your husband. Jesus is not attempting with these words to shame divorcees or pass blame or guilt and say, anyone, if you've done this, you're out. It's done. It's over. He's trying to protect marriage and protect women from being pushed to the margins. He's saying, people are valuable. You can't just walk in and be like, yeah, meh. In what circumstances can I do this? And it's still okay. Let's keep going. Let's keep going. We gotta, we gotta go through this quick. There's so much here, man. Again, you have heard that it was said to the people long ago, do not break your oath, but fulfill to the Lord the vows you have made. But I tell you, do not swear an oath at all either by heaven, for it is God's throne, or by the earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not swear by your head, for you cannot make even one hair white or black. All you need to say is simply yes or no. Anything beyond this comes from the evil one. Okay, so this one can be a little confusing, okay? Because there are oaths with God and with others, like, you know, the promises, sworn oaths with God and others in the Torah. It's all throughout the Torah. So like, what is he saying? Is he saying you can't do that anymore? Like it's not, it's not allowed. But at this time, we have to understand oath keeping was getting a little bit out of hand. Okay. It's kind of crazy. I read up on it and I'm like, that just seems really bonkers that they were doing that. That's just like, doesn't make any sense to me. Uh, but they were running around and what they would basically do is they'd say, hey, I promise, you know, I promise you, Isaiah, I promise you that I'm going to do, you know, X, Y, Z. And I promise on the temple. And he's like, whoa on the temple. That's a big deal. He's probably going to keep that promise. But then I'd go over here and I'd be like, oh, you know, like do, 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 doing my life. And I see Maddie and I'm like, oh, I promise you by the gold of the temple, which is a little bit more, a little more pricey, right? The gold of the temple that I'm going to do X, Y, Z. I'm going to do this for you. And then, you know, life happens, life happens, life happens. And eventually these two promises come into conflict with each other. Which one am I going to take? I'm going to go with the gold. And so I have to go to Isaiah and I say, you know what? I actually have to break my promise with you. And you're like, what? But you promised on the temple. And I'm like, yeah, but I promised Maddie on the gold of the temple. Ah, darn, you know, like, and so it was getting totally out of hand and they would do this on like extreme levels. They'd have like, you know, you know, 25 oaths at a time, you know, that I'm keeping. I'm like, all right, I want to get out of this one. So I better go make a promise to somebody that's higher than that. Once again, a way to just get out of it. And so Jesus walks in, he's like, hey, here's an idea, guys. Here's an idea. What if you just said yes or no and then did that? (laughs) Maybe, right? Like, maybe. Like, that's so far-fetched, I know. Like, that's crazy. But like, here's the thing. We still do this. We still do this with promises, right? I I did a thing. Okay, it's really weird. I don't know why I did this. I'm a weird person, I guess. I don't know. But, you know, pinky promises, right? Right? So I would pinky promise with people. But if I was like, this promise is, is more important, thumb promise. Thumbs are stronger than pinkies, man. Thumbs are stronger than pinkies. And so I would make a thumb promise. It was like a big deal, you know? But Jesus would see that and he'd be like, you know, you could just do what you say you're going to do, right? Like you're missing the, you're missing the point here. You're, you're missing the idea. We'd say, you know, I, I swear, I swear, you know, on my life. I swear on my mom. I swear, I swear, you know, on God. Like, like people say that all the time as if it's this kind of way to reinforce our credibility and, and what we're going to do. But Jesus says, here's, a, here's an idea. What if you were just dependable? 
What if you just did what you said you would do because that's the honest thing? Why do you have to try and, and, and you know, one-up it, one-up it, one-up it, one-up it, try and go all the way up, all the way up, just so that you can try and get out of one of the things on the, like the bottom of the ladder? Like, is that what you're trying to do? You're trying to get out of your promises? Once again, we are asking the wrong questions. Just do what you're saying, what you say you're gonna do, just do that. Let your yes be yes and your no be no. Plain and simple, be an honest person. He continues, you have heard that it was said, eye for an eye and tooth for tooth. But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn then the other cheek also. And if anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, hand over your coat as well. If anyone forces you to go one mile, go with them two miles. Give to the one who asks you and do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. This, this text right here, this little, this little blip, is often misunderstood, not in a bad way, because it still means that, right? We, we usually read this and we're like, oh, generosity and, and, and be peaceful and, and, and don't engage in violence and things like that. And we're like, that's true. This is true. But it's not the whole, we're not like all the way here. That. Does that make sense? Like we have here, Jesus's point is here. And it's, it's all of this, but we've only scratched the surface. We've only scratched the surface of what Jesus is trying to say here. So let's look at each of these examples that he says, and then we're gonna look at the point, right? The first thing he says, if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, right? And we need to know that in this culture, all human interaction is done with your right hand, right? Your right hand, because your left hand was reserved for your toilet duties, okay? That's what this left, this, his hand, no, do not touch people with that. No, no, no. Do not touch your food with that, nothing. This hand, off limits in pretty much everything. It was all right hand. And so if you're gonna get slapped on the right cheek, what does this mean? It means one of two things. Either I have to slap with my left hand, which is abundantly disrespectful and absolutely disgusting, or more likely what Jesus is referring to, a backhand with my right. I'd have to slap with my backhand. And the backhand in their culture, and especially in Roman culture, was a sign of great massive dishonor. It was extremely disrespectful to backhand someone. It was, it was reserved for like a lower class person. I, if I were upper class, I'd go to someone lower class and I'd use my backhand to communicate disrespect, dishonor, devaluing of that individual. A way to say, hey, you are beneath me. You don't even deserve the front of my hand. Backhand. And so to turn the other cheek is to say, hey, hit me again, but this time do it like we're equals. Turn the other cheek. Hit me again, but this time do it like we're equals. And, and in, a, in a weird sense, it's not just saying, I'm going to embrace what is being done to me, embrace the evil that is being done to me. It's not just that, but it's also, you're also calling out the injustice peacefully. You're calling out what's wrong without engaging in it. You're saying, hey, that's not right. Do it this way. Almost like you're radically extending an opportunity for repentance. You're saying, hey, you just treated me like, like someone who's beneath you. Why don't you hit me? Why don't you hit me like we're equals? And suddenly they might think, oh, wow, that was, you know, like you just put me in a weird position. Now I feel like I can't hit you. I don't know. Like, I, like, I don't know. Like, like it's just one of those weird things there. The next example he gives, someone wants to sue you and take your shirt. This is poorly translated, okay? The way it should read is, is someone wants to sue you for your outer garment, your outer garment, which means that's all that you have. Because theoretically, if someone's gonna sue you for something, they would probably sue you for what you own, right? They're gonna sue you for your house. But if you don't have a house, what are they gonna sue you for? Your shirt, your outer garment, the, the thing that you would wear that everyone sees as you walk around, okay? which means it's all you have. And if they are suing you for your outer garment, it means you'll have nothing left but your undergarments, your underwear, basically, in their time. And so he's like, if someone does that, if someone is so cruel as to sue, when, as to sue you when you have nothing and take the little that you have, peacefully show him how cruel it is and you give him the undergarment too. You show up to court stark naked and be like, he took everything, man. Like, I, this is all, I have nothing. I don't even have clothing. 
You're calling, well, see what's happening here? Once again, you're calling out injustice without engaging in the game. I'm going to call out what's wrong, but I'm not gonna fight back. I'm not gonna go and be like, I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna go take him down and sue him for all he has. No, I'm gonna say, look at what's wrong here. I'm going to peacefully, creatively say, look at what's wrong here. And this is the last one. I love this one. Roman law, okay, said that a Roman soldier could go to anyone, okay, anybody, citizen or non-citizen, and force them to carry their pack for one mile. You could say, hey, I'm a soldier. Here's my pack. We're going to go one mile. But Roman law said that only one is allowed. No more than one allowed. And so Jesus is like, call out that injustice. Pass the one mile mark. <laughs> Keep going. Now you're forcing this Roman soldier. He's like, whoa, wait, whoa, 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 quit it, quit it. You got to stop. You're going to get me in trouble, man. Like, you, you, I can't do this. I can't, I can't make you go two miles. But you, by you walking two miles, you are generously saying, hey, look at how you're doing something real not okay. Like, this is wrong. You are calling out the injustice by in some weird way embracing it. This radical peace, radical, radical generosity that brings attention, brings light to injustice. How does this all make sense? What Jesus is trying to say is that eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth was always about pursuing justice. You might be thinking, what? I thought about payback. You know what I mean? Like someone hits me, now I have to hit them back. Like that's how it has to go, right? And then it's just gonna be a never ending war. And it's gonna be like, I hit you because you hit me. Well, I hit you because you hit me. And it's just nonstop, right? No, this law was given so that you were only allowed equal retribution. So that you would only be allowed to do the equal thing. It was to prevent someone from saying, oh, he took my camel. I'm gonna go burn his house down and kill his family. Like, like the, you weren't allowed to do that. It was, it was trying to keep a limit on what you would do back and forth so that peace and justice could just be and happen. Settle this, it's done. But Jesus is like, obviously you're not understanding it, right? You're not understanding the whole keep it equal, keep it from getting crazy point. No, I have to take it a step further. So you obviously confuse this. Let me make this easy for you. Don't even play people's game when they mistreat you. Don't fight back. Don't make it a whole thing. Simply bring the injustice to light and provide the opportunity for repentance and justice. That's all you have to do. And I want to clarify this. That doesn't mean passive aggressively bringing injustice to light. I know, we're all like, ah. Oh that was my way out. <laughs> that, was, that, was, that, was, that was right in front of the line. I was going to try and do that, you know? That's not what that means. Because that's still, guess what? That's still tr us trying to get the self-satisfaction of putting ourselves up and putting someone else down. Saying, you are, you are unjust. I, I'm up here. Asking the wrong question once again. We can't help it. I know that. We're, like, we're still trying to get what we want. We're still trying to come out on top to put somebody down in some way. To be honest, I, I think all of these things that we're talking about today are very difficult in our current context, in our current world. Our culture is rampant with anger, lust, divorce, mistreatment of people, you name it. But revenge is one thing that we really have a hard time with. We really have a hard time. Even if it's like a small thing, a very small thing or a big thing. We have a hard time. When we are wronged, we feel the need to engage in the game, to fight back. Our pride forces us to. Like, if I don't fight back, who am I? I'm not gonna let them disrespect me like that and get away with it. I have to prove this. I have to prove something about myself. I have to settle this. Even if it's not physical, but just a passive aggressive comment. But Jesus says, hey, in this kingdom, this is how we do things. We pursue peace in a loving way through radical kindness and generosity. That's what we do. <clears throat> and a lot of the time for us, that probably means waiting. Okay, that means waiting. Because a lot of the time we don't have what it takes to, to listen to the spirit in the moment. And so we got to wait a bit. Waiting to cool down, allow our emotions to settle before we speak so that we can allow the spirit to speak into the situation and move us forward lovingly as Jesus would. 
Paul says in Romans, and I like to think that this is his paraphrase of of Jesus in our text today. He says, do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. Don't get in the game. Pursue peace and justice in all things and not retributive justice that where they get inflicted with whatever it is they just did in some kind of way, but redemptive justice where peace gets restored, relationships heal, and love is present. Paul continues, he says, on the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. If in doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Which leads us to the end of our text when Jesus says, you have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your father in heaven. He causes the sun to rise on the evil and the good and says, rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing this? And if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Do not even the pagans do that? He says, even your enemy has value. God, says, God sends rain and shine to everybody. Love your enemy and pray for those who persecute you. Do not repay evil for evil. If you love your friends and you hate your enemies, what makes you any different? What makes you any different from those that you call sinners? I love that. So bold of Jesus to say to his followers. He's like, wow, you guys sound like a bunch of pagans. Like, like, that's crazy. He's like, you love your friends and you hate your enemies? What makes you different than the pagans? And they're like, uh, (laughs) shoot, I don't know. I guess I'm a pagan. I don't know. (laughs) Like, like, uh, they don't know what to do with that. What makes you different? Love is the mark of the kingdom. You want to be children of the father of love? You must also be love to everyone. Everyone, even those that you feel are invaluable, those who hurt you, those who are pushed to the margins. I hope you see a theme here. Not even just in today, but in the last several weeks of messages. But this is all about people. Today especially, this is all about your heart, your inner self, and the way that you view and treat others. This is not about the outward actions. In the kingdom, we strive for peace and love. We try to settle our disputes rather than harboring ill will and hate towards one another. In the kingdom of God, we see people as people rather than a means to an end, and we don't look at people as objects and desire that which we cannot have. In the kingdom of God, we value marriage and we don't break marriage covenants just because, because that causes damage to people. No, instead, we try to make it work. We try to make things work. That's the, that's the question we ask. We don't say, how can I get out? We say, how can I make it work? In the kingdom of God, we are honest, upfront, and dependable. We don't double back on our word or make wild promises to everyone that can't be kept. In the kingdom of God, we are people of justice, not retributive justice, but redemptive justice. We see injustice around us and we embrace it and we bring it to light as we do. We creatively pursue peace and justice with radical kindness, radical generosity, and radical love, all for the sake of peace and love with other people. All in all, we are people of love in this kingdom. That's what it's all about. If you are a citizen of the kingdom, you are a person of love not just toward people that like us or that love us, but everyone, even our enemies and those who hurt us. And Jesus closes all of this, all of these things, all of these lessons with one final statement, wraps it up with a bow saying, be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly father is perfect. We read that and it freaks us out. Like I can't be perfect. Perfect isn't necessarily a wrong translation for that word, but it has wrong implications and connotations for our culture. The Greek word there is telos which would better be translated, which would be better translated as whole, complete, fulfilling the full extent of its purpose. Like when I use a tool for the purpose that tool's made. He's saying, be whole, complete, as your heavenly father is whole and complete. Be complete. Be complete. That's the point of this whole thing be complete. 
not just your outward actions. In the kingdom of God, we are not just people that care about outward actions, but inward postures. We are not so concerned with, you know, just the, the murder and, and, and the, the adultery and the divorce and all these different actions. We are concerned with the inward posture. Let me just say that again. In the kingdom of God, we are not just people that care about onward, outward actions, but inward postures. We desire to be whole, inside and out, congruent. We don't ask ourselves the questions, how far can I go before I cross the line? No, we are people of complete transformation, the outer and the inner self. We don't care about not just murdering people, we care about not hating people in the first place. We want to be whole. We don't care about just loving a select few people that are easy to love. No, we love everybody because all people have value in the eyes of the Father. True followers of Jesus, citizens of the kingdom of heaven, do not care to look the part to escape the consequences. They want to be the part completely and wholly, truly. To actually become like Jesus and not just kind of sort of resemble him. To not just be like, oh, I kind of look like him. I kind of do the actions, but the heart's not changed. That's just looking the part to escape the, the consequences, right? But to actually be the part. So I want to challenge you today, church. Allow Jesus to touch every part of you in your life for the way of the kingdom, this kingdom right here, the way that this was all laid out to seep into your life seven days a week. This is how you treat people. This is how you operate in the world. This is how you handle your conflict and your disputes. This is how you do things. It's time to be all in all of yourself, holy. This is what it means to follow Jesus. And it may be challenging, but it sounds beautiful. And I would love to live into this with all of you. To be the kingdom right here. Today, we've actually got a few people that want to be whole and they're gonna be baptized today. There are some people that have said, you know what, I, I don't wanna just look the part. I wanna be it. I wanna give all of myself to Jesus. And so th this physical act in the baptistry of, of being brought into the kingdom of God, changed inside and out, old self being left in the water and the new self coming out, inner and outer, the inward postures now being made new, complete as their heavenly father is complete. And so if you have not taken this step before, I encourage you to join them today. We have a change of clothes, the water's warm, nothing's stopping you. If you wanna take that step to be, to be whole, to fulfill the purpose that you were created for, to give yourself to Jesus, you can do that today. It's time to be complete. Let's pray. Father, you are, you are whole and you are wonderful. You are beautiful. And Lord, we wanna be just like you. We wanna be just like our dad, just like our father. So Lord, I pray that this community of, of God, this community of kingdom, would embrace that fully today, that we would walk in a new living, that we would not just care about outward actions, but inward postures, that we would desire to be complete in the way that we, that we live, in the way that we are, not just in the way that we, we actually do different actions, but the way that we see people and view people, the way that we understand the world around us. Lord, change us today, sanctify us in your truth. Change us, Lord Jesus. May we be complete as our heavenly Father is complete.
praise you this morning, Jesus. Amen.